Perfection is often elusive, but good teachers continuously strive to achieve it. And the ideal classroom in education is the epicenter of teaching and learning. Throughout the school years of a student, the four walls of a classroom encapsulate life-changing interactions between the teacher and their students. During these life-changing interactions, the learning environment is key to unlocking many doors that will lead to each student to new uh, frontiers of knowledge through their faculties of understanding deep inside their minds. However, there's a serious impediment to the progress of these standards when it comes to the quality of education in the country, which is overpopulation in schools. Issues around this tumbling block uh, to the success of obtaining qualitative education will be the focal point of discussion tonight on the program. I am your carrier, Clinton, and this is Nigeria Today. Welcome. Joining us in the studio is Ambassador Tama Monde Yari. He's Executive Director, African Center for Youth Development, Education and Advocacy Initiative. Good to have you with us on Nigeria today. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. And also here with us is an educationist and a former chairman, uh, chairperson of the National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, Federal Capital Territory, Ulushola Bankoli. You are welcome to Nigeria today. Thank you. Good evening. It's always well, a pleasure having you around. Us. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll start with you, Ambassador uh, Tama. Uh, could you take us through the threat of uh, population explosion in our classrooms and uh, lecture theatres as a serious concern for all of us when it comes to quality of education? Okay, uh, thank you for this. Is there's no better time to discuss about this than now, looking at what is happening in the country. You know, uh, I, 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 I go through public school, so I have a practical experience of what it means to, but primary, secondary, uh, not university. University, I think I, I touch on the private too a little bit. Uh, it's honestly when the population is too much, you know, the delivery will not be there. And also mentally, the student will not, will not be interested in the learning curve. You know, there will be this loss of interest. I remember when I was, I, 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 I was in Yobi, 2017, and I decided to go to schools. You know, I decided to embark on a training to train student. And I remember I was in Ali Marami, particular secondary school called Ali Marami there. And when I get there, the chairs were few, but the students were many, and they were sitting down on the floor. So after when the teacher is done teaching, you know, some of them that couldn't get seat, have to wait when everything is done, that they will then meet their fellow student for them to be able to get what, what the teacher, you know, taught them. So that's actually, you know, in that process, the person that jotted probably didn't get it right, didn't get everything right. Before, you know, he transfer his own little knowledge to the next person, the next person will be looking, oh, have you, been, you know, have you been able to copy? All this thing is because of the overpopulation in classes. But when we have few, you know, the few student ratio to a teacher will be able to deliver perfectly. Okay, so uh, Ulushala, uh, you had him there. Yeah. I also had my own personal experience uh, coming from a public school. Now, how, how can the overcrowded uh, classroom, just like he mentioned, impact on the intellectual uh, capability of um, the students or pupils? All right. Um, as he mentioned, of course, there are factors that make for effective learning. Um, one, of, uh, one of the core factors, of course, the, the students, the teacher, the resources, the environment generally. And of course, the classroom is a critical part of the environment, even though, you know, nowadays we, we do not limit teaching or learning taking place in the uh, four walls of the classroom. The, under the tree could become a classroom at some point. But the, the, the truth is, you know, that's where, um, you know, is formally indicated as the classroom. And so it should be comfortable for the students. So if it's not comfortable because of overcrowdedness, and like I was, you know, mentioned the other time that um, um, crowdedness is not a function of um, few number, because it has to do with you know, just opposing 
the number of students with the space available. And you see, another thing is that space ma spatial management is very critical, even for the teacher who is managing the class. Um, if, a, if a classroom, interestingly, I also went through public school all my life. From primary to university, I went to a public school all through, even though now I'm running a private school. And that's why I don't like this idea of public school are like this, private school are like this. I like us to look at it. What's going on in education? So, you know, when a class is overcrowded at whatever level, in the public school, in the private school, there is a problem with the learning that the children are going to get. It's not going to be thorough learning. Some years back, an organization, RISE, did a survey, and they were talking about learning crisis. Across the world, especially in Africa, and most importantly, in Nigeria, we talk about out-of-school children, but even those that are in school are not really learning. One of the problems is overcrowded class. The opportunity, he gave a very typical example. Some were able to sit, just a few had seats, and maybe table to write. Others are standing. What do we make of what those ones will learn? The discomfort will not allow them to learn effectively. So we need to do something about it. Uh, okay, so uh, she, she rightly pointed out a, a few examples. Like I said, I had my own personal experience, uh, even though I had to run out of the crowded class to join the science class because I needed, uh, you know, <laughs> I needed where I would learn and really understand what I, I went to school really yeah, to do. Now, however, how best can this problem or this, will I say, this challenge be tackled? Because, uh, yes, it's a challenge, it's a, a problem, uh, but it is solvable. Definitely. So how, what are the uh, areas that should be looked into you know, to tackle this uh, problem? Okay, uh, thank you that, for that again. There are many areas, you know, a lot. First and foremost, we need uh, the issue of infrastructure. You know, most of our schools are outdated. You know, if you move outside, the FCT and you know go to other states. You real, you know you know what I'm talking about. That some school needs to be renovated. One, then also, uh, just as you said, it's not even about the number of schools or it's even about the class or about the number of people in the class. You have to know how you ratio it, how you put it together. One of the thing also is uh, those people in charge of education, most especially at state level they need to step up. And what do I mean by stepping up? They need to pay attention to what is happening in those schools. And because I am a youth advocate, you know, we have been advocating for you and thank God we, the African Union next year will be a year of education. You know, one of the things we are trying to push is education, you know, they should stop seeing education as empowerment. It should be, an, you know, as an investment. You know, we are putting in this for us to be able, to, it is a, it's a mindset game. You know, and the truth about it is no nation grow beyond the quality of our education. We'll just be running in a vicious cycle if our education is not right. So we need to move from that mindset. It's, it's supposed to be an investment. How much am I putting to this? You know, and the quality of people that schools will graduate in a year. You know, how many, in, I mean, quality engineers. You know, when we start seeing things from investment point of view, then just, it's just there. I have the money to send my children abroad. Your children will finish and come back and meet those people who are illiterate and they will find it very difficult to move. Uh, so one of the ways, as I said, one of the ways is for those in authority to understand that education should be an investment portfolio, not an empowerment where you can just go and throw money and go. You know, so when you establish a school, go back there after three years. Know what they are doing. How are, you know, just cut out the survey. Oh, after three years, what has happened? How many students have graduated, the scores, the result, are they doing well or not? Then you try to find out from students, why this, why that? We'll be able to have a very good approach in solving this problem. Or else we keep pumping money and we don't know what the money is, you know, yielding, yielding to. So I think we need to start looking at education from the point of investment and empowerment. Okay, before I ask you your own opinion on these, uh, you know, on the ways to tackle this challenge, I would love you to explain to us, especially for some of our viewers that are watching, some, you know, a, a lot of uh, them own schools and uh, all of them. Does it have uh, emotional, does this overcrowded uh, classroom or overpopulated classroom have emotional or psychological effect 
on the teacher and the students and how it, exactly you know of course definitely mm. um, and that's why the quality is very poor in many cases um, when a teacher for instance have say 60 students I'm trying to be very practical you know practical <laughs> and then even sometimes you know be economical because I know that in some cases there have been some classes in public schools that we have visited and you're seeing a hundred students in one class 120 to one teacher the, the truth is it can be overwhelming it can be exhausting and um, it's going to be very difficult for a very good teacher to make sense of that class. You, you want, you know, teaching is not just standing in front of students and just shouting down some information, you know, trying to force it down their throat. No, it is supposed to be engaging. You're supposed to be able to listen to students, give their opinion. There are things they have learned that you may not even know is more current than what you read before you came into the class. There are things that some of them watched the news and they saw you know, he's okay. This is how things. Some of them, are, you know, we, we are dealing with Gen Zs right now, and a lot of them, you know, see a lot of information. So there should be interaction. The crowd will not allow the teacher to have enough of such interaction. And schooling, education, the most important aspect of what we do in schools, formal settings, is to teach children to think. How does that happen? if there there is so much crowd like i said the teacher will be overwhelmed even a very good teacher an excellent teacher will find it difficult yes some may be able to manage but they won't be able to reach their all their students as they should even when you know you are you have a 35 minutes period or a 45 minutes period in secondary school to reach out to your students before 30 minutes before you even settle down the class, a class of 50, 60 students, <laughs> time has gone. And then you have this to deliver, you have notes for them to copy. But I, I, I will encourage that as much as possible, because I know there are still a few teachers, even in some of those public schools, that are making a lot of efforts to see how much they can reach out. I saw one a video that went viral, you know, between yesterday and, and today, of a teacher in a public school, like I don't know which state, who had, um, I did a calculation, I calculated about, f about 50 students were in that class. And it was, you know, it made sure they were well lined up. But of course, those ones were the privileged ones who had desks and chair, every child was seated. But where there are no seats, you know, even that ability to, one of the other things we do as teachers is to be able to connect with our students. We want to reach out. A child that used to be very vibrant and happy, is now so moody, you want to read, maybe there are 20 of them in the class. Which one do you reach out to at a point? And then before you are done, another teacher is by the door waiting to take his or her lesson. And if those lessons are not taken, the head teacher, the principal of the school is on your neck. So we need to sincerely, he mentioned, mentioned something, and that's always an approach I have to educational issues. And that is, let us have a mindset, a, a, a renewed mindset to the essence of education. It is not just for children to go pass exams and leave. And because of the emphasis on such, that's why we are seeing a lot of cheating going on, a lot of malpractices, and a lot of lack of zeal for learning taking place. Because when they get to the school, then for the students, the crowdedness, there are some people, individuals that their health does not allow for you know, you know, breathing into each other. Mm -hmm. That is health challenges could come in. Some get headache when the place is stuffy, you know. And then how does such a how does such a student learn? You know, and then an ability to support one another is not really there because the crowd is much. If it is sizable, say like 40, 30 in a class, I'm sure you know the teacher may even group them and they will be able to support each other. But when the number is really massive. It's difficult for the students to learn. And then social interactions, what they, you see a lot of times is competition. Oh, there are only 30 chairs and tables in this class, and there are 70 students in the class. They are struggling to know who sits first and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's always a difficult environment. But if we have the mindset that 
okay, the purpose of education is to support children to learn so that they can help to develop the society. I'm sure with such mindset, gradually we can do a little here, a little there, and then we'll move on. Thank you very much. We'll take a break now. The conversation will continue after the break. Please stay with us. The implementation of the ruling is also dependent on another aspect or another harm of government. Nowhere in the world will allow under digital economy for banks not to be dispensing domestic currency in that economy. What would make this one different? We want to know what they do as occupation. All of these uh, attributes that are questions have been designed to investigate. In a few days to come, we'll see that we are all along their own crannies and uh, uh, everywhere in Nigeria uh, telling people to cooperate. Welcome to Nigeria today. Welcome back. It is still uh, Nigeria today and we are discussing overpopulation in our schools, in Nigerian schools and the uh, quality of education. And I still have my guest here with me, uh, a gentleman and a lady, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Mandy. Now, what is the role or what should be the role of the stakeholders in, in all of this? Because we are talking about, uh, you know, improving or uh, trying to have a better quality of education. Because at the end of the day, if you go to school and um, uh, it's not just for the fun of it. You don't just go to school because you're going to school, but you should go to school and, you know, be better off than you were when you got in there, you know. So talking about quality, uh, quality of education. So how, what should be the role of the stakeholders, the role of parents here in ensuring that we have a uh, uh, good uh, 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 education? Okay, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, just as you said, the whole essence of education is not just to know how to read and write. It's far beyond that. You know, education teaches you about life, you know, how to go about your daily activities without encroaching on another person's uh, zone, you know, on how to, to separate the good from the bad. So it's not just, so if we actually want to have quality education, what I mean by quality, quality, mental, you know, that's why after when you finish from university, they just just write, you know, you have passed, you know, how to read and write. Mm -hmm. They will say you, you have been satisfied both in character and in learning. So oftentimes we focus more on the learning. Oh, we want to have people. I think back then, I, I, I don't want to mention whether secondary school or whatever. We have a very good boy who know how to read. The guy was always taken first. But he has issues with drugs. And he couldn't graduate. You know, the school just have to expect. He was good. But he lacks the area of character. You know, so we have to see it from that angle. So the role of stakeholders here is first the parent, you know, you need to first and foremost make them understand, first and foremost understand that it, because these days I'm part of that generation that we feel education is a scam. You know, after all, even if I don't go to school or I go to school, there are people who are making it. So why should I go to school? So the parent need to put us right. Like, no, education is not just to read and write. Education is not just for you. After all, you have money. Education goes beyond that. It teaches you how to use that money well. Even if afterward, probably even if you are normal, you know, there are, you know, organizations that live over years, over generation. You know, so we need to begin to make them understand that. And also values, you know, we need to make, you, we need to make most, most especially young people that doesn't see need to go to four walls because technology is everywhere. Why do I need to read book when I can just say, what is this? And it will give me all the answers that I need. Why should I go? So the parents need to make them understand or make us understand that education is beyond this. Then also in the area of, is broad, in the area of government, they need to be accountable in all these programs and projects and initiatives we because so much is being put in in this area but no result they need to revisit their plan you know it, it it has to be bottom top approach not from top you know before you get down to the beneficiaries everything has finished 
Well, if it is from bottom, mm -hmm. top, you know, uh, and the example is, do people in probably, let me say, Asokoro, need more computers in their school? How about people in Kavanchan? You know, do they? So when you begin to look at, it, I say, okay, I think people in Kavanchan need more of this than this because I, I, I don't know what I, if you, you understand me. How we can balance, balance the, the provision. How we can balance the, 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 the input. What, what we give, you know. So this, the policy makers, the people in charge of formulating programs and the SUBEP and UBEC mm -hmm. should see it as a point of duty to be accountable in all their actions. But parents play a very vital role because they are the first school and they are the last school. The people in the school only have few hours. You know, when they get back home, they meet their parents and if the parent didn't show any signs of, oh, we care about what you do, you know, it becomes an issue. So that's one among many. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Olushila. Uh, um, um, we're still talking about uh, over, you know, uh, crowded uh, classrooms. Now, you, according to UNESCO, UNESCO, although other educationists are not um, uh, in agreement, they, are, they don't. Uh, uh, some agree to it. Some don't really agree. You know, the ratio. They said in the class there should be thirty to thirty-five per class. Why some education is say uh, 30 to 45, you know, uh, we're talking about the ratio of students to teacher in a classroom. 40, some say 30 to 45, some say 30 to 35. Mm -hmm. So what should be the ra ratio here, you know, in order not to have, you know, overpopulated classroom and to have uh, effective learning and effective teaching? Second, please. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Um, like I said, you know, uh, it's um, for the public schools, mm -hmm. you know, uh, usually the classrooms are built that are large enough to be able to take in quite a number of students. And like, I think the average is about 40 to a teacher mm -hmm. in a class, you know, um, on the average between 35 and 45. So let's pick 40. Okay. I think generally, you know, a teacher may be, if, if well equipped and trained and retrained with, you know, best international practice and, you know, current trends and all that, may be able to undo that. But you see, that's not to make private schools run because depending on the classroom size, mm -hmm. there are, you know, classroom sizes that will take in comfortably. What, what, it's, what is important is the desk and the chair of a student should give space with the other student. You know, the other time we had COVID, mm. and so we were, it, it became difficult for some schools to even continue because they had to more like now have to build more classrooms because you need to create space for other students in the class. The teacher needs to have breathing space to be able to move around and check what's going on in the class, not that children are clustered together. Yes, when that is done, when that space, and then it's also critical that teachers need to have um, a skill of special management. I'll tell you that because I've seen that practically happen. I have a teacher who is a guru when it comes to special management. A space that some teachers will feel, oh, you can manage it and all that. Within a day, he can <coughs> rearrange his class three times. If, and then he has so equipped his students that if he says, setting one <laughs> within a few seconds you see that the class is switched they may want to go in circle another time they want to do the lecture method the theta method another time is group method but he has trained it, is, it took time because sometimes if the teacher doesn't have that special you know management ability he won't be able to to really get that done but generally for effective teaching and learning to take place we need to be mindful of for me, for me, I think 25 to 1 teacher is just the best. You're even going below the UNESCO. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, th that's why I said maybe for public schools okay. where they have a large oh, room. room. Okay. Yes. Because you see, the nitty gritty of quality education is not just give them activity to do and go and sleep. Mm. You need to be on top of what they are doing. There must be engagement. Okay. If there's going to be engagement, if there are more than 25, it's going to be a bit difficult. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you very much. As is on Nigeria today, we want to thank our guests for sharing their thoughts with us. The Executive Director, African Center for Youth Development, Education and Advocacy Initiative, Ambassador Tama Mondiyari. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. And also, uh, Ulusha Labankoli, our educationist and former uh, chairperson, National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, Federal Capital Territory. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's a pleasure. And to our viewers, thank you so much for always being a part of this. Remember, the program Nigeria Today airs weekday at 7.30 p.m. on NTA News 24. You can also watch this and other episodes on www.youtube.com slash NTA News 24 Hub. I am Ikeria Clinton saying bye for now.